Sometimes I'll put a card in their uh, leftover Tupperware in the fridge. <laughs> so when they get their meatloaf, <laughs> they see Chris. Uh, oh my god! How you those bobblehead do dolls that you had designed for yourself? <laughs> yeah, how, they well. out? Yeah. yeah, those work. Those work well. Chris has trading cards of himself. <laughs> so, in, their in, the, in the plastics. In the plastic. <laughs> in the plastic sleeve. Yeah, perfectly normal. Hello and welcome to episode nine of the Life Insurance Academy podcast. I'm your host, Austin Lopes Vero, and I'm here with Chris Ball, Zach McElwain, and Roger Short. The LIA podcast takes you out of the classroom and into the conversations of top producing agents in life insurance sales so that you can level up your business. For cliff notes and resources, visit liapodcast.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Life Insure Acad. Today's show is a little different than other episodes we've recorded. One of the core values of our team here is Voices Matter, and that carries over even to the production of this podcast. So last week, we opened the mic to you, our audience, and we are so excited about the response we've gotten. Yeah, Austin, this, is, uh, this has been kind of fun. I mean, we're putting out some uh, content that we felt like was important, and people are responding to it, and it's been fun to see the responses. You know, it's kind of like... We baked a special cake and people find it delicious. <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh, and man. now they're asking for more cake. More buttercream. <laughs> it's more buttercream. It's, it's kind of taken a life of its own. It's taken on this life of its own. When you put stuff out there and um, you wonder how it's going to be received, and then you start getting feedback from coast to coast and all kinds of comments like, I uh, just discovered your episode and I'm going to be binge listening this weekend. Can't wait for the next episode. Uh, next week, keep it up. Great job. And then the questions and feedback from California to Florida. I mean, it's... Uh, and see the shining sea. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> from, it's, it's pretty cool. From New Jersey to China. People are telling so us that they love it better than Designated Survivor. Designated Survivor. <laughs> I mean, good show. Not sure about season three. <laughs> yeah, I hear bad things about season three. Anyway, season three is not great. Anyways, we diverge. We did get a question that we're going to cover today, and that comes from Shelby. She's an independent agent out of Florida. Hey, Shelby, thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you so much. She actually sent us this question over Instagram, but we were able to have her sit down and record the audio and send it over. So let's take a listen. Hey, guys, it's Shelby. I've been able to build great rapport with my clients, but something I struggle with is having the referral conversation. What are some ways that you transition into referrals where it feels natural and not forced? Shelby, what a great question. Thank you so much. Now, before we get into the transition, I'd like to lay some groundwork on referrals, including the mindset an agent should take to help them generate these really essentially free leads. Chris, when you were first getting started in this business, were referrals anywhere on your radar or were you pretty dependent on the physical leads you had? It wasn't even a consideration. I I just became a a lead junkie in a way, you know, (laughs) where I'm looking for my next fix of leads just to to go see people. And if I burnt through my leads, then I didn't have anybody else to talk to at all. (laughs) That was it. I was done for the week. Yeah, I think... Whenever you're going through uh, sitting with clients in homes, regardless of um, you know if you're in mortgage protection sales or final expense sales, always doing the right thing for your client and putting them first and knowing that you're caring for them. You're not just trying to push policies or sell this or that, but being that advisor, being that friend, being their lifetime agent really communicates and speaks volumes for them because now they know if somebody else in their family reaches out to them um, and says, hey, I, I'm, I've been looking at this. Do you all have this? Or who do you all go through? And they're going to say, oh, I go through Chris. Or I go through Zach, right? Uh, he was great. He sat with me. He explained everything to me, made sure I understood, and he got us the plan that we needed to protect our family or protect our home or to protect our kids or to make sure our final expenses are taken care of. And, you know, when you think about it, I'm, like me personally, I don't open a, um, a Yellow Pages. You know, if I'm going to... You're not old enough. <laughs> have you ever have you ever done that? Have you ever personally opened a phone book? I have. I have. My grandma asked me to look up some phone numbers before, so I pulled it out of her drawer and I would open it. You know? Okay. But that was a very young kid, right? But uh, <laughs> like me personally, if I want something, if I want to make a home repair, if I need to fix a, a plumbing issue, or if I want to know who 
uh, looking at price co- price comparing on uh, car insurance. We talked about you know last episode. I'm going to ask my friends or my brother, or family members, who they use first because I trust them. We have a relationship, and it kind of gives that agent some credibility. I don't know their agent or who they got their car insurance through or homeowner's insurance or who fixes their hardwood floors or replaces carpet, but it's that relationship that you establish, and that works mm-hmm. the same when it comes to insurance um, because you know they don't know where to go. They don't know where to look. And they may or may not fill out some cards, but I'll tell you one thing, they will trust their warm market agent, which is us or you, um, more than they would anybody else. And that doesn't have to just come right now. Um, Chris actually got a call this week from a client that, uh, from not from his client, but from a referral from a client. Yeah, yep. I wrote up a, a couple, five years ago, and they were having a conversation with uh, with a friend, and just last week about life insurance, and they recommended that they they call me, and I was able to help them out. So that was that's nice when so, you get those calls. It's a nice surprise. The referral game and the ratings and referrals by personal endorsements is huge. It's a huge industry. I mean, there are companies again built on this. I think we talked about it somewhere yeah, in, else in uh, episode five on trust. Yeah, Amazon, the ratings and reviews, the Angie's list. The referral game is strong, right? It, it's it's a strong pe- agents. However, if you're in the leads business, sometimes they just ignore that. They they don't know how to have the conversation with with people. Um, when I first started. Austin. So I, I, I transitioned into this business. I wanted I wanted some leads to work. I, I made up my mind very quickly that I wasn't going to pay for my leads. So wait. So you wanted to enter an industry yeah. and not pay for leads. I wanted free leads. Yeah. So like, how does that work? <laughs> so Rose paid for him. <laughs> so, he finds a poor agent at the gas station and goes and takes his leads out of his car. Oh dang! <laughs> so I decided that if I got twenty leads, and at the time I think that you're the, paying for and I'm, that I that I purchased. Okay, that I purchased, and you know I think they're around twenty five bucks when I was starting, and there was these were direct mail, final expense leads. Uh, at a batch of twenty, you'd probably have about thirty opportunities because you had a husband and wife on some of those, you know. And so, but out of that thirty, I recognized that those thirty people have a warm market. They have neighbors, they have family, they have friends, um, uh, the person across the street, you know, uh, an adult child that lives with them, grandkids that that they care about. And so there's there's all these other people in their warm market that if we service these people properly and take care of them and bring value and earn their trust, all we have to do is have the right conversations and they can refer us on. And that referral is is like a golden ticket from American Idol. You do get to go to Hollywood because when you walk into that next home, you've already had the groundwork laid for you. So the first part of what we talk about establishing trust of the five real reasons why people don't buy, a huge endorsement's already been placed on you. Mm-hmm. And so you now can w- work into that. So I realized out of that 20 or 30 names that I had, there was going to be someone that I was going to find whose name wasn't on any of those that was known by a person who's on there that I was going to sell a policy to and that commission would cover the cost of my leads. So mentally, I was working to find that referral all week or two to cover the cost of the leads. And I knew if I got two referrals a week, I would make at least an extra thirty to fifty thousand dollars a year, depending on you know what the AP was and stuff like that. So it was a way for me to cover my marketing costs, put extra money in my pocket, and have a great business that was growing. Yeah, I was going to say it's it's kind of a twofold mindset and you can take one, you can take the other, or you can take both, but like one mindset says I'm going to get free leads by doing referrals. The other mindset says how is this going to affect my overall bottom line if I just do one to two referrals that you're talking about? What if you did one referral to cover the cost of your leads and then everything additional, you know, Zach, you're a numbers guy. I'm sure you crunch numbers of what one or two more apps gets you and how that affects the year. Yeah, like Roger said, it, it can be an extra thirty to fifty thousand, depending on how you're working that. But I did something very similar um, when I was purchasing leads. Uh, my leads cost a little bit more than that at the time, uh, but you know, I I used that to really pay for my leads, just like he did. Um, and when you do that, now you have 
20 or so leads that cost you nothing and now you have opportunities. But you don't look at it that way because everybody on that card um, or however you're going to see your clients, you know, whether in your mortgage protection or final expense, they probably have brothers or sisters that are in the same age and most likely the same income demographic, the same living situations. Um, they probably have parents that may or may not be still alive. Um, then they also have grandkids, nieces, and nephews that are in their family. But when you think about um, no matter what market you're serving, they have all of their warm market probably has the same needs as them. Mm. And that every lead is really endless opportunities and can turn one lead can turn into 10 more leads. Yeah. So each of you have kind of mentioned some different groups of referral types, right? You've said neighbors, you've said friends, families. Like, let's kind of dive through each one of those and what does that conversation look like, right? Like, Shelby's question was sometimes I struggle with having the referral conversation. So let's just tackle that one at a time. Well, Shelby, I don't know, and I'll speak directly to you. So if you're listening to this podcast again today, which I'm assuming you are, um, I don't know what type of uh, selling environment you're in or what type of relationship you have with the insurance group that you're with. If you're part of a captive agency, if you're doing life and health, if you're operating as an independent agent, if you're working any purchased leads, if you're working leads provided to you by an organization that may have been called through by a bunch of people, or if you're just working more market one at a time, you know, getting referrals. Um, regardless of what that looks like for you, when you're sitting with a client, if you frame the conversation early up front with an expectation, people want to help. People legitimately want to help. One of the biggest things that I see is the we create our own roadblocks by just not asking. You know, Chris mm-hmm. said I didn't even think, and I was out of business. I didn't know what else to do. Like you have you have sixty two customers that you've already serviced and wrote policies on. Like you think you maybe could call back some of those or <laughs> yeah. stop in and visit and say, hey, tell me who your neighbors are. I want to I want to reach out and leave them something. Or so there's all kinds of ways to do that. But if you frame the conversation up front. Saying, hey, thank you so much for your time. You know, I want to let you know this is uh, this is what I do for a living. I'm passionate about it. I would love to be able to service and become your agent, not just for you guys, but for your family members, your neighbors, other people that you might know that may have a need for this. And maybe we can talk about that when I'm done. And set the expectation early so that when you're done the com- you know done taking care of them, you can come back to that conversation. So one key part of that is setting the proper expectation upfront that this is a key part of how you build your business. And that will that will keep you in check that you're trying to provide real value. Because again, we talked about previous episodes, if you elevate the value, people's response to you, their urgency, how they feel about you, everything changes, right? They want to refer you because you're a good person who took care of their needs. And um, even when you're not asking, sometimes they come back to you like the one Chris had reached back out to him. But your intentional process is setting that conversation and framework up front early. It's one way that no matter what type of sales you're doing or what market segment you're in, framing that up front and then circling back to it at the end is a great way to have that conversation. I want to give you a good scenario. Um, you know, many of our people that we sit with, either mortgage protection or final expense, they they do have siblings. Um, they have parents, things like that. Um, I know I could ask these guys this question of how many times has a sibling been in the house and you wrote another application on the sibling. For what oh, is the percentage? It's, it's happened you think? Often, often, more than not, probably. Oh yes, more yes. than not. Yeah, yes. whoever's in the house, there is right. going to sit down with us. Yeah. So inviting people to come and sit and see and feel the urgency, the need, the desire, all that stuff—they're part of the experience. So what's different? What is different about somebody who's in the house and who's not in the house? That's the big question. Because if they're in the house, we're probably getting the application. If they're not in the house, we're not. If Do you, you don't, if you don't have like, a plan the, up front yeah. to talk to them, Correct. it's not on your mind. So if it's not a part of your strategy going in, it's not a part of your strategy. Right. Like you have to, you have to know that those people exist whether they're sitting in the house or not. And is the need less? No, the need is That's no less. The thing. It actually might be greater. 
And right. here's, here's the thing, mm-hmm. you know, Shelby had mentioned that she's she's been really good at building rapport with the client, mm-hmm. um, but which is great because you're developing that connection, but you also need to make sure you're taking notes and understanding and preparing for that. Like, oh, how many sisters do you got, brothers or sisters? You're writing down their names. You know, what's your relationship like? Do they live around here? Did they all move away? Um, you know, how often do you get to see them? Do you all get together for the holidays? Are you pretty close? Do you all do bowling every Wednesday night together? You know, trying to, to, to understand that relationship um, and who is kind of the, which one, which one of the siblings in the family is the one that kind of steps up and takes charge or mm-hmm. kind of leads the group. Like finding out this information while you're building trust with the client will be crucial for the end. Because after you take care of this client, and we always talk about segmenting that cell. Now you mentioned your do- your your sister. She's been dealing with some health problems. You know, when you when you can find out that information in that trust building process, that makes it so much easier to open that door at the end, um, where you sometimes struggle to ask for those referrals. It makes it not of, hey, do you know anybody else I can sell life insurance to? Um, another uh, another thing that I. I used to work regularly once I dialed into this, is especially in the senior market, final expense sales. Um, grandparents love the idea of protecting their grandkids. And so there's this big opportunity to sell children's and grandchildren's policies that grandparents can actually take out themselves. They're the owner, they're the payer, and they put protection on their grandkids. Like because oftentimes these these grandparents know of tragedies that's happened in the lives of their family or friends that's lost a grandchild that you know in their teenage years or even in their early child years for for whatever reason, and they want to make sure they have protection in place for the benefit of their own kids, and so they have this high value. So one of our carriers, Mutual of Omaha, Mutual of Omaha is not sponsoring this particular episode, but maybe in the future. Um, so uh, they have a great children's policy uh, that runs from, I uh, forget what the ages are now, but I think it goes up to age 17, uh, just a few weeks old up to age 17. And you can go up to thirty or $40,000 in a benefit, in a whole life benefit. These are so inexpensive, super, super inexpensive. A lot of people have heard of the Gerber baby grow-up plans. Like grandparents are aware of these plans. We have a Gerber's, another one of our carriers that we offer. Um, so there's opportunities for that. But when we're having this conversation with grandparents and you see them talking about their grandkids or talking about their children's children and there's pictures, you can have that conversation and they see a high value. They, they just went to a ball game or they went to a swim meet or a soccer game and they're so proud of them. I have always used to reach into my bag and I'd pull out that little brochure and I'd just set it on the table as a reminder to me, Mrs. Smith, before we're done, make sure I talk to you about this program for your grandkids because if I don't, you'll be upset with me if you find out about it later. And I would just leave it there. That would set up the conversation for the end for me to find out who the parents of the grandkids were. That's really an good. opportunity to sell a policy to the grandparents for the grandchildren. Uh, these are this is a referral sale to your own client, an additional sale or an upsell, mm-hmm. uh, not an oversell, but an upsell. Uh, but oftentimes, it's a great way to get the referral to the kids, mm-hmm. right? And their adult children, who are the parents of these grandkids. And so when you're packing up all your stuff, before you put that last brochure away, you say, oh, yeah, Mrs. Smith, remember I put this down earlier? Let's have a quick conversation about that. And it was a great lead-in to ask for the referrals and opportunities for additional sales. So that was, that was one of the, the techniques that I used. It worked great for me. I like that exercise, especially for new agents right? that are trying to get into it. They're trying to remember to you know, walk through the five real reasons and mm-hmm. their presentation to have these simple tools that they can use as reminders that you know they might they might have forgot otherwise but by seeing that you know they're setting themselves up for success later and it force functions them like that's a great tool that Roger uses because there's no cop out you mm-hmm. know he he said it there and he said to remind me to tell you about this no he he has to do it i mean he has to take the brochure out and say those words and say that to the client but Chris, can you let Shelby know and our other listeners what a force function or a forcing function a is? A forcing function is taking taking an action that causes you to move forward. That's basically that simple. Huh? So um, it's accountability for yourself or creating accountability pieces in your life. Um, you know, and and maybe part of that force functioning is saying to your your manager, your crew, your running buddy, whoever it is, I'm going to have five referral conversations this week. That's a force. The force function, or better force function, is I'm going to give you ten dollars if I don't 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a go. real force function. Like putting skin in the game or a, a consequence to it, so that you do take action, mm-hmm. because that's the only thing that's going to move the needle. Um, but yeah, I, I would say I'm going to give away ten of these children's mutual yeah. Omaha brochures this week. Yeah, and I would put ten in my bag. Yeah, and by the end of the week, if I didn't have them done, I would, I, I didn't do my job. Correct. Now, even more like when you're sitting with clients and finishing up, and you really provided value. And when I say provided value, that doesn't always mean selling a policy. Even if you were able to sit with a client um, and organize their existing policies and their paperwork to make it less confusing when that day comes and they pass away for their loved ones, that is a, that is a huge value point for them. Um, and whenever you're able to do that, it makes the conversation so much easier. If you know, Miss Jones, do you know anybody else that I might be able to help at least? Um, give them peace of mind knowing what they already have is exactly what they need and it's going to protect their family. Or if they're unsure or if they can't find their policies that we can make sure we can get new copies sent out to them. And that value that you displayed already with your client will carry over. And you had mentioned your sisters went through some health problems. Does she have anything in place to protect her family or what is she going to do? Is she married? Like Those questions is a lot easier to bring up because you've already ask them and, and understood and cared about the relationship at the very beginning of the sit, and now you're readdressing that. Um, but the real magic happens is when you start, yeah, that you know that might be good, or does she live around here? Because then you get the phone number. You get mm-hmm. the address. One, one of our forcing functions is that at the end of our final expense presentation, it's literally printed on the page of, you know, I forget what page, page seven or eight, uh, of the of our current final expense presentation uh, um, slide seven or eight, you know whether you're showing it on a computer or a flip chart, uh, is who else can I help? You know who else in your family can benefit from having an, an appointment with me? Whether it's just to help them organize, present some ideas. Who else can I help? And I mean, in some markets, Austin, it is crazy the value that people have on their life insurance, and then what they will do for you if you simply ask. I know guys that. We've been in different markets from Michigan to Texas, right? And uh, the markets are entirely different. People respond differently. But there's, uh, there's opportunity everywhere. There's families that have high value everywhere. In some of our uh, Louisiana markets, you guys have been in Louisiana in homes. Um, you get in some of these rural markets, and boy, those people have a high value on their life insurance. Yeah. They want to make sure their family's covered. And all you've got to do is say, hey, who else can I help? And can we get them over here? Chris, have you had things like that oh, happen? Oh, my goodness, yes. What, can you share maybe one of those stories? Yes. Yep, we had a, a whole family in a trailer just packed to the gills, realizing <laughs> that the mother had, um, this was kind of sacred space, this home. You know, if something happened to her, she wanted to make sure it was covered. It wasn't just a final expense conversation anymore. And the the value that we had created in the importance of having something in place it led over into the other conversations of people in the house and um, I we ended up writing seven grand in that home and then I think Zach went back the next day I did because yeah. we were there so long now not on one client no no these were on multiple now, family you seven thousand you're talking yeah. about in annualized premium yes mm-hmm. so like yeah, six hundred dollars a month on multiple policies on multiple policies and, you know I was looking around and there were so many family members in that house and everybody's looking at her and and I said are you like is everybody waiting for dinner on you and (laughs) she said yeah she's supposed to make dinner so we ordered pizza and had a great time and uh, that pizza was gone in 3.5 seconds I mean you made it easy for everyone to move forward right made it Mm -hmm. known you were there to service all of them yeah Yeah. that was uh, definitely a long sit for you and the next day was a longer one for me um, because I was able to go with that agent as well and button up a couple of those applications and while we were there we asked for a few more referrals and I think we wrote an additional three applications on one was I believe her brother one was um uh, another one of her daughters that wasn't there the previous day, and then the uncle. I mean, we, you know, because of that, have value, and like we talked about the, um, the the being validated by her, you know, of of the care yeah. we gave her, correct, just spread through the family, and it's a completely different uh, trust building process after you have that endorsement on your side to be able to move forward and help other clients. 
And one of the biggest tips that I can give anybody is what happens when you get that referral. You know, do you, do you take that phone number, that address? Do you put it in your bag? Do you call it next week? Do you call it from your phone? I think that's probably the tendency. I mean, people are thinking, well, yeah. I got the referral and I'll just well, let when me my run leads my are done, leads first. Yes. Yeah. You know, then I might get to it. Run they, my leads first. But they oh, never boy. do. We've got a golden right. ticket right here and we're going to go try to find someone else on yeah. the lead card. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, whole, the whole idea is about it. And what I like to do is when we're having that conversation, I ask the client to go ahead and give her sister a call or her mother a call, or her brother a call, or her nephew a call, whoever that person is. Call them right now on their phone because they're going to answer their phone and much you know, more realistically than they would answer my phone because mm-hmm. they don't know my number, right? They see their sister popping up there. What do you want? You know, and so they answer. But the client talks to them for a second, but I always ask, may I speak with them? Because it's a lot different coming I mean, I get the endorsement from the client at the beginning, but then I want to have control of that conversation because if not, you know, the client may say, well, I got an insurance man here. He said he can get you this for $32 a month. Well, yeah, yeah, one, that's thing, not gonna go very far. one thing that we know is, is being in this business is it's not about price. It's not about money. It's about those five real reasons. It's about establishing all of that. Um, and so one thing I don't want to do is make it about a dollar on that phone because he's going to decide right there if he can afford or not without value, right? Mm-hmm. So I want to get on the phone with him, explain who I am, the group I'm with, how we're able to help people, not how we're able to sell people, how we're able to help people, and just build enough curiosity and rapport with him that um, to just go meet with him. At all costs at that point, I want to go directly over there. It, it, Shelby, it depends on what market you're in. So if you're in a final expense market, and people are home during the day or during the evening and you're in you know, a senior demographic, oftentimes their peers, brothers, sisters, they're also not in a working position. They're retired. They're, you know, uh, they're available. I've had Zach have done exactly what you said. You know, we get to the end of our presentation. Who else can I help? Tell me about your sister that you were talking about. What's her name? Where does she live? Oh, she just lives three doors down. Well, let's go ahead and call her right now and see if we can uh, see if she's available. If because, she's three doors down and walking over, because I've got some time, <laughs> and she'll call her sister. You home? Come on over, and like they'll they'll actually prompt it. Come on over here. I want you to meet somebody. Next thing, ding, the door's ringing, and hi, this is my insurance. And you're having this conversation, but you've got to be proactive, be intentional up front, and then follow up at the end to be able to make that happen and prioritize that referral. Don't just put it in your box to call next week, like Zach said. Have your client reach out on their behalf, create the contact, so then you can have the conversation to either see them now or set up an appointment for tomorrow or this week. The imminency, you know, the, the immediacy of your appointment time with them drives up the likelihood of a conversion and a sale. So also remember that, like keep that in mind. Uh, another force function that, that I have done in the past is to go to uh, Walmart and pick up a bunch of gift cards, like, uh, you know, $10, $20 gift cards. And then at the end of our conversation, uh, let them know that um, I would like to bless them and their family. Who else can I help? What are some names? And I, if I can get three, five names of people that I can help, I'm going to leave this card with you. You know, and as far as force function goes, you can even do what you did mm-hmm. with the children's application and lay a Walmart card down and say, let, let me tell you about this at the end because you're going to be mad if I don't. You know, as part of it too. Yeah, and it's just, and we can give. A, I think there's a limit on how much you yeah. can give. I think it's seventeen thousand dollars. Is that right? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Maybe like twenty or twenty five bucks. 25. I think. Yeah. So we can. You can actually do, uh, and we would call that kind of a transactional based referral sure. system, where you're saying, "Hey, listen, uh, we we do uh, we have a promotion where you get an incentive if you refer us a client." And uh, but I'd love to be able to serve your family. Who can I help? You know, I have this. I have this gift card for you. If if we can. If there's some people that you can help me see, because this is how we grow our business, those are the cheapest leads you'll ever ever use. So yeah, that's a that's a great uh, forcing function there. Another one um, that uh, in our final expense space that works really well is uh, a pattern that we teach, and it's called clover leafing. Or uh, Zach, what's the other term that you use for that sometimes? Running the T. Running the T. You want to describe that one? Yeah. So like, if you're ever going to a client's home, whether you just finished up a sale, you did a door knock, and nobody was home. Um, really no matter how you get to the home, but you're turning around and you're looking to leave. Instead of getting in your car and just going to run your next lead, you have three additional opportunities right there. You have a house to your left, you have a house to your right, and you have a house across the street. 
So it's directly a T or a three-leaf clover. That's why we get the term clover leaf. But what that allows us to do is it gives us more opportunities. No matter what market you're in, most likely the neighbor is in the same income bracket. They're in the same age demographic. Um, and most likely they have the same need as the client we just served or are about to serve. Um, so it also, they, though the people across the street and the two neighbors most likely know our client, um, more than the lady down the street. Yeah. Would. By name. Yeah. Yeah. They may have been in each other's homes. They may be great friends. But what it does is it allows us to be able to, um, one, gather information. So let's assume in this situation that my client isn't home. Okay. So I may go knock on the neighbor's door and introduce myself, say, hey, um, I'm, I'm looking for Miss Miss Linda, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm in the right place. She may, it may be next door. I wasn't quite sure. And they're like, oh, yeah, that, that's that's next door. No problem. Well, my name is, you know, Zach McWay, and I'm with Senior Benefits Group. And the reason I was here to see Miss Linda is that she had actually sent this request form in, um, requesting more information on the state-regulated final expense plans here in Kentucky. Um, and I just wanted to – I noticed she wasn't home. Do you know when would be a good time to catch her, or, or does she normally work late? So I'm able to gather information – of when my client's going to be home, but then I'm also going to say, now, you said your name was Bill. Hey, Bill, um, did you happen to get your card in the mail? It looked just like this. You might have accidentally thrown it away. And he takes a glance at it, and then, well, no problem. That seems to happen quite a bit. A lot of people accidentally throw these away and not really sure what they are. That's why we carry extra information with us. I'm going to go get some stuff. That way um, you won't have to worry about getting any cards in the future, and we'll go ahead and get you taken care of while I'm here. And boom, that's an opportunity to sit with a client. Now, when that same scenario... That's Jedi mind tricks. I was going to say, like, that's, that's turning one lead into four. Right? Right. Yeah. Like, you yeah. have your lead and then mm-hmm. plus... You're exactly three. right. I mean, we're able <laughs> to use those names. Um, and it just so conveniently, the guy, the host of this podcast, has created uh, a magical... Um, what do we call it? I, clover I leaf just card? Clo- clover leaf card. Yeah. Clover, clover lead. Clover leaf. Clover leaf. There you go. Uh, he's nice. created his own his go. our own form that we actually give all our agents to just lower that barrier and make it a little bit easier for them to show um, a neighbor a lead card or an example of what they would have filled out to to be able to get in the doors with them. Yeah, a mailer that uh, would be something that we would send out, uh, you know, yeah. with basic information that they could respond to. With Mr. Jones' contact information. Yeah. <laughs> it's called the Clover Lead. <laughs> so the other side of that is, let's say we just finished up with a client and we're not gathering information of when the client's going to be home. Um, now we're leaving and they're like, oh, so your neighbor, how, how is the neighbors around here? And you're, ga- you know, you're talking to them, you get their name. So now you can go knock on the door and say, hey, I just want to let you know you, Mr. Bill. I'm actually, uh, you know, my name is blah, blah, blah. I go through the same spiel again. And um, I let him know that I was able to just help this, you know, the neighbor, Miss Linda, out. She filled out this car and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, yeah, I, I say that because I don't want to have to keep repeating the whole <laughs> line because that, that costs about 20 bucks too. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Um, but what it does, is it starts a conversation with the neighbor. And when you do run the tea, it's not just one neighbor. You have three of them. You have three opportunities for every one lead that you run there. We're servicing people that have already expressed an interest, or we're sitting with clients that we've just serviced. How much easier is it for us to be able to do those things, but it has to be done with intentionality? So asking before, during, and after your sales presentation, letting them know this is a part of what you do, being intentional about it, and then following up. Uh, not just following up right then, but also following up with your clients a week later, two weeks later. Sometimes the referrals don't come right away. So Shelby, if you take good care of your clients, your clients will take care of you. Mm-hmm. That's right? exactly Build right. a book of business, take care of your clients, and your clients will take care of you. I serviced a client just about three or four weeks ago who had some questions and concerns about her policy. I helped her out over the phone, and then there was a situation where I had to go do a visit with her, and before I went to see her, I said, now, um, Miss Deborah, who else in your family can I help when I come? Because you know that you and I have a great relationship. Who else in your family needs coverage that I can help? Well, I got two brothers, and I'll be talking to both of them. I said, will they be there when I'm, well, let's schedule my time to come see you when they're going to be, when I, can, when I can get them there. My, well, my son, he needs some coverage too. I mean, the conversation opened up. Well, I ended up not meeting the son because he left 
One brother was like, I got to go. And the other brother came down and we wrote a policy on the other mm-hmm. brother. Just, that's just servicing your client base. And so, but you have to be intentional. Um, another thing I'd, I'd want to say is um, be aware of who you are as a professional. Like have a social media presence. Like you're in a profession where you're helping people with financial services. Like beware of what your Facebook page says. Right. Right. Do you have a LinkedIn profile? Um, beware of what your Twitter feed is all about, right? If you're slamming everybody all the time or if you're actually conscientious about what it is that you're trying to do as a professional. Um, present yourself as someone that's trustworthy. Present yourself as someone who's open for doing business and that you love what you're doing and that you're here to serve clients. Like, make it known. Don't hide it. <laughs> make it known. So these are some, these are some key pieces that, that you need to think about. Uh, in in your in your space. So remember, you have a brand. You, you Inc. You have a brand. So represent your brand well. The uh, the idea of being open for business or closed for business that's probably going to be a, a podcast. But <laughs> uh, this this idea of leaning into asking who else you can help, not asking who else you can sell, is a big deal. There are agents, I see the numbers they put up, I see the activity they put in or the lack of activity they put in, the unwillingness to ask questions. And and I tell them sometimes, I couldn't do what you're doing for a living right now. I would not I would not choose to do this. And the reason being is there's a proper way to do these things. And the numbers work differently for the people who do the right work. And if you don't do the right work, they're going to work against you. It's just a fact. Jack. One thing to remember is don't be afraid to ask for those referrals, especially after you service a client. Even if you don't get any right now. Um, get any business, like right, any policy. Right, or you can't make a phone call or they don't have anybody immediate or maybe they call their brother or their sister or their mom and they're not interested at the moment. That doesn't mean they're not going to be interested in the future because things happen in people's lives that we know that makes them start thinking about this stuff. You want to be able to be the first person they think about or they call your client, their sister, to get your name later. Or it doesn't hurt you to leave that card with the neighbor. Or, or even leave cl- multiple cards. Right, leave right. multiple so that way, cards. You know, if they want to keep your card, if they need to contact you, they still have some. Because at get. some point, they will. A referral isn't only successful at the moment. It will be successful in the future as well. And the, here's the other side of it. If you don't ask... You'll never get a phone call. If you Mm -hmm. don't leave cards or plant seeds to your client or their warm market, they will never think of you when they are looking for something. People in the final expense industry um, probably are more aware of this than in other segments of uh, the life insurance sales industry. There are... I, I still believe that there is a way that we can serve this market at a higher level, provide more value and more care. Um, it's unfortunate a lot of agents in this business have a one-call close with their clients and their clients never hear from them again. It's sad. Um, We sit with clients all the time. They request more information. And they bought a policy from someone two years ago. They felt like it wasn't enough or they need more coverage. Instead of calling that person back because they have a relationship, because that agent followed up and stayed in touch, they fill out another card or something else <laughs> yeah. or something online that we sent them, and then we're in the house, you mm-hmm. know, and they actually have another policy from two years ago. Why is that? That's because the agent is not servicing and taking care of their client. As you build your client base, make a database of your clients. Keep a spreadsheet. You know, uh, keep your, your, uh, your, your policies so that you have a way to communicate with people, service them annually, you know, call them, reach out, a birthday card, a thank you note. We have one agent that has, uh, uses a service for cards that has her photo on it, that has the, the company brand logo with a nice thank you note. And every time she writes a policy, about four or five days later, she just uses the online service and triggers that card to be sent out to clients. It makes a huge difference. Well, and then also she sends one, I think, every Christmas and every birthday. Yeah. Like she puts that client's birthday in her calendar and it's on her phone, it's on her computer. As a reminder. so every time that birthday comes around, she's both calling them and sending them a card. 
Yes. We all know who that is because she's at the top of her game on that. And so, yeah. uh, so Carol, great job to you. <laughs> I'll right. just give you a she shout actually, out. Great she actually job hand writes them. Yeah. And so another simple thing, like use a business card that has a photo of you on the card, especially if you're in the senior market, right? Mm. People love think physical things, right? Just we may personal. share our contact from phone to phone, right? Mm-hmm. With younger people, right? No, who, what younger person is keeping a Rolodex with cards in it anymore? They're not. But I don't know Sarah's phone number. Yeah. So, <laughs> is that however, true? Yeah. wow. Oh, wow. You know, when we. What color are our eyes? Oh, what? boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Sorry, when, when you're leaving a home, when you're finishing up with a client and you've, you've helped them, don't just quickly leave the brochure and get out of there. Leave some of your branding identity in the home with your business card in it. Give one to the husband separately for him to put in his wallet and then walk one over to their refrigerator. And in most cases, the refrigerators are still magnetized and take one of their magnets and put your, your card on the refrigerator under a magnet and say, so when you lose all the other ones and you need to call your agent, I'm right here. And it's got your picture on it. Guess what? A year later, two years later, they're still looking at the same picture. Like people oftentimes do not move that stuff oh, around. There's it's, magnets on my dad's fridge. Yeah, so I'm yeah. Like, and so what is this? And wh- who is dad? Who is your life agent? Oh, he's over there on the fridge. I know that guy, right? I know. Like I look at his face every day when I go get the milk. <laughs> yeah. Like think about little things that make a big Some, difference. Sometimes I'll put a card in their uh, leftover Tupperware. In the fridge. Jeez. So when they get their meatloaf, Chris. they see Chris. Uh, oh my god! How did you those bobblehead do dolls that you had designed for yourself? <laughs> yeah, they well? out? Yeah. yeah, those work. Those work well. Chris has trading cards of himself. <laughs> yeah, so. they're in, the, in the plastics. In the plastic. <laughs> in the plastic sleeve. Yeah, perfectly yeah. normal. So little things go a long way. Service your clients. Take care of them. Do annual reviews. Follow up. You build, build your book of business. Your your clients will take care of you. Guys, I think we answered the question. Shelby, you'll have to let us know what you think about this episode and if these transitions work for you. I know you had another question regarding friends and family that we didn't get to cover, but we hope to answer that and many other listeners submit ideas and questions on future episodes. So if you have a question or if there's a topic you need help with, or if you have just general feedback, let us know. We'd love to hear it. Go to liapodcast.org slash feedback or just send us a voice memo with some nice, clean, crispy audio to feedback at liapodcast.org. That's our email address that you can reach us at. I believe for anyone that we use uh, um, their question and we do an episode, I think we're doing this once a month, the, the first uh, the first Wednesday of the month. First Wednesday of the month, uh, we're doing this listener feedback or agent feedback. Uh, if we use uh, your question or your ask, we're going to send you a free gift. Yes. So Shelby, be on the lookout. And to our entire audience, thanks so much for listening to the Life Insurance Academy podcast. For cliff notes, resources, and more, visit liapodcast.org slash EP9. That's liapodcast.org slash EP number nine. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. Give us a five-star rating and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Life Insure Acad. The Life Insurance Academy podcast is hosted, edited, and mixed by me, Austin Wilkes Vero. This episode was produced by Roger Short and myself. Our theme song is by Flashing Lights. We'll catch you on another show, including next week's episode, where we'll discuss door knocking how to get in front of clients. Drive safely and go be a difference maker.